I think for such a long time, um, the psychedelic space was so focused on showing that it wasn't just about like a party drug that fried your brain, mm -hmm. but we're shifting now. I think people are starting to wake up to the fact that there's healing properties to this. So rather than just overstating the benefits in order for things to get ahead, can we work to build frameworks that are actually accessible for people? Welcome to the multiverse, where we believe that mushrooms can actually save the world. Each week, we'll be meeting with thought leaders and experts to extract the best insights and stories across everything from functional fungi, psychedelic medicine, and so much more. Thanks for listening. Step into the multiverse with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Into the Multiverse. Today, we have Dorna Porang on the episode, and I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, You're one of my you. favorite humans as far as coming to, you know, do I, I come to you for everything psychedelic related, everything that's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. You have such a very interesting perspective because of all of your work. By way of introduction, mm -hmm. you have a lot of things that you've done, but here is like the brief cliff notes from your LinkedIn <laughs> that I've gathered. Thank you. Um, you are a psychedelic advocate, clinical researcher, and you specialize in oncology, psychedelics. You do everything from, you know, operational aspects of clinical trial planning, um, developing timelines, you know, vendor management across all phases of clinical trials, which actually we haven't had someone on to talk about. So I'm really excited to, to dive into this. And sure. previous organizations you've worked with, MAPS, PBC, Estella's, um, Agensis, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many. Uh, you're currently advisor for Mudwater. And there's, there's a lot more in there. I know you're advising for several other companies right now. But to start, I'd love to just hear like a little bit about your story. Who are you? How did you land here? How did you become you know, one of the most sought after voices in, in psychedelics. <laughs> well, thank you. I feel very flattered and now kind of shy. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think from the start, I was always primed to be a little bit of a geek, which is part of why I'm getting a little bit shy right now, because I'm not so used to being seen. So I kind of grew up very bookish and in the science field. My dad's a nuclear physicist um, and now a medical physicist. Uh, come from a family of doctors. So I think I was kind of primed towards that. Um, but I think one of my big flaws is that I'm pretty easily bored. And so I actually, on the path to working in medicine, I was working in research and I found that to be a lot more complicated and dynamic and interesting and complex. And I like a challenge. So why not go somewhere that does that endlessly, right? And so um, I worked at a couple startups in oncology. After I finished undergrad, I studied biochem. And um, I ended up landing on a couple of drugs that made it through and did really well. So I got really lucky in that respect, because um, that was by chance so early in my career, right? Um, so I worked on a couple of oncology drugs that made it into market. Um, back in 2012, around the time that I started working in the field, uh, Obama passed some legislation for uh, what we call FDA breakthrough therapy designation. So basically, if you were able to show through the FDA, through that clinical trial process and getting drugs approved into pharmaceuticals, that the drug you were working on met some sort of critical unmet need for an existing illness that just either was terminal or didn't have any other options available. And you were able to show in your earlier trials that you were that, you know, that these drugs were working so much better, you were able to get sort of ex accelerated review and approval because typically the clinical trial process for drugs is very lengthy, right? Um, so I worked on one of the first biggest oncology drugs that made it through uh, that FDA breakthrough therapy designation process known as Pembro, now known as Keytruda with Merck. Um, and so that was kind of like the baptism by fire of like working on that study and learning all the ins and outs of clinical trials and what the importance is of you know making sure your data is clean in order to get things through to approval. Um, so I did that and then uh, worked at Agensis, like you said, a startup, and that actually got picked up by a big pharma company. Um, and the drug I was working on made it through market through breakthrough therapy designation as well and made it through to approval. So again, like a lot of luck there, right? Falling onto these things pretty early on in the career. Um, and then just in my personal life, you know, I think in having a family that was so deeply rooted in healthcare and science, I saw a lot of the limitations and disillusionment. I saw a lot of burnout, like in the healthcare workers in my family and, um, you know, things with insurance companies and a lot of the people like, you know, my family and friends that were going down that path were not happy. Um, and seeing a lot of like disillusionment and disenchantment with 
just the systems that are at play here in in healthcare and capitalism. And it, it really bleeds into like every sort of industry, I think, in this country. But in healthcare in particular, you know, it's so close to us. It's the thing that matters the most, right? So uh, as I was working personally with psychedelics, you know, I tried ayahuasca for the first time when I was 26. Um, and I, I had a really sacred approach to it where it was really about, you know, having reverence for the healing aspects of it and understanding what it meant culturally. And you know, I sort of had this inkling that there was maybe some sort of way to respectfully, you know, reroute some of these sacred traditions that had been largely wiped out over the years um, from Western culture and somehow integrate it within our healthcare system. And I thought maybe through clinical trials, but it seemed like such a long shot. And, you know, lo and behold, MAPS was doing that at the time and they had just received the FDA breakthrough therapy designation, you know, that same trial pathway. Um, and so, uh, when they, I saw that they had reached that for MDMA assisted therapy, and they were looking to expand. I said, "Okay, I got to get on that and and help them with that." So I was there for a few years, and you know, in that period of time, like 2019 to 2022, like you know, you've seen what's happened in the psychedelic industry, right? So a little bit of luck and a little bit of just an explosion happened there. Um, and so yeah, it's it's been a wild ride. The industry has just completely, I mean, evolved and expanded into something I never thought it would be, and being kind of one of the earlier players in that and facilitating these clinical trials gave me a really interesting and unique perspective. So yeah, like you said, I'm just advising on a lot of different uh, companies and nonprofit initiatives and people who are more integrated in the culture there and just trying to make sure that we expand this with as much integrity as possible. So yeah, it's been exciting. It's, you know, it's, it's such a cool journey that you've had and you've obviously done a lot of work. I actually think out of all the people that I'm, that I'm most in contact with, you've been the deepest, like I said, in the actual clinical trials. You know, a lot of what I spend my time thinking about it and talking about is like the consumer side and what the future of mm -hmm. consumer products will be like in the psilocybin space. But like, I'd love to kind of dive um, and get a clear understanding for both myself and the people that are listening to this who like don't really understand like what is happening in clinical trials across yeah. psychedelics, you know, in the world at large, but like also um, in the US, you can answer that in the lens of like the ones that you've specifically worked on, but just like, you know, 10,000 foot view of like what is happening right now, like what's underway so people are aware. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think, um, you know, this goes back to what I said about that breakthrough therapy designation because, um, you know, in the startup pharmaceutical industry as whole, um, getting that FDA breakthrough therapy designation was a really valuable thing from your company. Like just from a, you know, an operational or commercial perspective, if we take a, you know, the lens off for it a little bit, if a company was able to show this preliminary, preliminary really strong data mm -hmm. and then get that governmental approval to get accelerated review and approval from an operational perspective, like developing a drug can take hundreds of millions of dollars and like over a decade. So if you have a startup pharma company and you're able to show that the FDA is willing to give you the accelerated review or breakthrough therapy designation, that automatically shoots up the valuation of your company. So the interesting thing here is that MAPS was the first company to do that with a psychedelic. And so, um, or psychedelic assisted therapy, I should say, psychedelics in congruence with therapy. But MAPS was nonprofit funded at the time. And so I think all the people in the drug development space said, hey, wait a second, like that's kind of a billion dollar idea right there that is not, you know, that they're doing for nonprofit and fully open source. And so then popped up all of these other private companies that are adapting similar frameworks for psychedelic assisted therapy and now psychedelics on their own to treat a number of indications. And so, you know, Atai and Compass launched with their psilocybin assisted therapy. They also got breakthrough therapy designation. Uh, Johnson & Johnson did the S-ketamine, so the ketamine analog for treatment resistant depression. They also got breakthrough therapy designation and it's now available. Um, and then that just, I think, spewed this explosion of just this like massive bubble within the industry of psychedelics where you know all of these startup companies are in this massive race and it's a bit of a bubble that's bursting it's almost like a grab bag like a patent grab bag an indication grab bag. psychedelics for weight loss psychedelics for this psychedelics for that and mm -hmm. all the different analogs and okay let's let's you know modify that salt a little bit and put a patent on it so that way we can put it through for this and what's a new creative way that we can administer it so that way we can you know it's like a million different companies and you know to be honest i a lot of them are not going to go through, <laughs> to be you know frank with you there. Um, but there's just this you know massive level of interest, and so I think right now, like there was this period in the last couple of years, there was a lot of venture capital money, a lot of companies going up, and we're starting to kind of see you know especially as the market in general is kind of slowing down, we're seeing the slowing down in that market as well. And I think the cream is kind of rising to the top a little bit. We're seeing like the things that have established legitimacy are starting to pick up 
a little bit of speed, but that takes time. Like clinical trials take years to run. So it's going to be a few years before we see a lot of these purported things that are out there. But there's a lot of strategy that's in alignment with startup pharmaceutical strategy of trying to pick indications that have broad applications. And then, you know, we're really in the development phase of everything. But in the coming years, it's going to be about rollout and how do we get this implemented and how do we get insurance companies to cover. And so in terms of the landscape in the next couple of years, uh, MAPS is anticipating that um, or hoping that their IND will get approved next year. Um, so that would be the rollout of that. So that would be really nice. Um, ketamine assisted therapy, as you know, is already available. Um, and then psilocybin, probably in the next few years, they're still in phase two studies worldwide. Um, and then everything else really is in phase one. Like there are some new studies that have kicked off with DMT uh, administration and DMT assisted therapy, like Beckley SciTech and Small Pharma. Um, but those have just kicked off their, you know, very, very early phase studies. So it's going to take a couple of years for them to be able to show their primary outcomes, like in their clinical trial design, that these things work. And so just so people are clear, you know, when you get an approval to do a study from the FDA, breakthrough mm -hmm. therapy designation, you, you start with phase one, mm -hmm. you do your first trial, which on average maybe takes like six to 12 months, something like that. Yeah, about a year. About a year. Um, and then you you go, there's no skipping steps, right? You go phase two, phase three, and yeah. then we're starting to see, you go know, like the rollout of psilocybin. Obviously, yeah. ketamine didn't Ketamine didn't go through those three. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, so phase one is a dose determining study. So that's where you determine your maximum tolerated dose. So how much can you safely administer to this person without a lot of analysis for efficacy? It's just like, how much can you give this person? Who's the participants for that? <laughs> Healthy volunteers usually. Wow. Yeah, unless it's oncology and, and some other like, you know, where the drugs are maybe a little bit more impactful and you need to have some like efficacy data. It's usually healthy volunteers that participate in those studies. Good question. Yeah, people are like <laughs> raising their hand. They're like, hey, I will take yeah. you know, whatever, 10 grams of mushrooms. Yeah, or whatever I think someone could make a good amount of money off of like just creating a psychedelic clinical trial recruitment site because everyone was asking like, why can't I be the healthy volunteer? in that study so actually i can tell you how to do it right now if anyone wants to know Absolutely. how to <laughs> like, i think this is super important i think we need to i think we need to dive into this yeah. if people you know if and that is a question it's it's yeah. funny because you know and we were talking about this before like a lot of this conversation is um funny in a sense because you know psilocybin most psychedelics are schedule one substances they're still fully yeah. illegal mm -hmm. i get hit up on instagram all the time being like i love all your content about mushrooms i'm so excited yeah. about the work you're doing where can i find you know microdosing products and yada, yada. and it's mm -hmm. you know it's still very much illegal, even though all these brands are shipping all across the you know the world. Really, yeah, like a lot, yeah. of, you know, a lot of them even on Shopify. It's wild what's mm -hmm. happening in the space. But yeah, um, legal way to do yeah. psychedelics right now outside of traveling outside the United States, mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for psilocybin yeah. or you know MDMA, mm -hmm. is to sign up to be a volunteer for these trials. Like if people are interested in doing that, how do they access that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, the question you asked before about ketamine, I want to cover that really yeah, quick because yeah. that plays into for this sure. because ketamine is, you know, legal now, mm -hmm. um, you know, with prescriptions. So um, you were saying it didn't go through that same process, right? Yeah. And that's because it was never schedule one. So ketamine was used medically as an anesthetic um, in veterinary applications. You know, we've all heard like horse tranquilizer and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so what Johnson & Johnson did was, you know, it's a dissociative psychedelic, so it's a little bit of a different mechanism as some of the more classic psychedelics, but um, they put it through some of the later clinical trials because they already had that approval to use it as an anesthetic. So it was really just to add the indication of treatment resistant depression. Um, so they were able, that's part of why it went to market so quickly once they kind of put their eyes on it because they didn't have to do that phase one in order to determine the MTD, maximum tolerated dose. Um, and so um, for MDMA, psilocybin, things that are still schedule one, like you said, you need to get approval from the DEA, FDA, institutional review boards. It takes a long time. <laughs> I know a lot about it. Um, and so for that, um, one of the things that is important to know if you're interested in enrolling is that legally all clinical trials have to be disclosed, CTD, clinical trial disclosure. So the CTD process goes through a website called clinicaltrials.gov. And so that's a government-owned website. But if you get a study approved by the FDA, RFB, and in this case of Schedule One studies, DEA as well, you are legally required to disclose certain facets of your clinical trial, where it's being operated, who it's being operated with. It will have contact information there. And so it can be a little bit of a beast to navigate. It almost kind of looks like a peer-reviewed journal website, like a PubMed or something like that. But yeah. If you look, I can just give like the the step by step. If you click on advanced search, you can just filter out your location, 
Um, and then there's a keyword search there and you just want to type the substance that you're looking to use. If you type psychedelic, it won't show much, but if you type MDMA or psilocybin in, um, some of these substances, like for example, S-ketamine with Johnson & Johnson, like if you typed in ketamine, that wouldn't show up because it's like an analog. But if you're trying to just, you hear about a certain substance that's interesting to you, you can type it in in there and it will show you where the studies are being conducted all over the world and it'll show the status. So like, is it active? Is it enrolling? Is it fully recruited? Is it closed? And you can apply directly through the website. Site. That will provide the contact information to you, okay. and then you kind of got to like hunt down the individual institutions yourself. So I, I recommend for people to do that if they're looking to participate in a clinical trial, because if you go directly to the pharmaceutical company or the sponsor, that's kind of like a, it's a little higher up, and then they'll kind of have to disseminate to see what the enrollment status is at each individual site. Because each individual site will probably have a certain number of slots, a certain number of people have lined up, and mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, there's just certain HIPAA privacy related things with like people reaching out to sponsors directly. So um, I'd say your your fastest way to get in would be reaching, finding out which sites in your area are employing those clinical trials and reaching out to them to try to get in. And then okay. like certain, web, like MAPS has their own website for recruitment and you can go in and fill out forms on there and then Right, like existing like big companies you can find it as well. Yeah. I, I just think this is super interesting. And so it's, it's ctd.gov? Clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah. And just so people understand like how many clinical trials, you know, not not exact number, yeah. like because I know they shift all the time, but like how many clinical trials are going on just in the United States right now underway? Would you hundreds. say hundreds? Hundreds. Hundreds, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's something to be mindful of is like, you know, unless it's a healthy volunteer study, it's gonna there's a good chance it could be placebo controlled. So we talked about like the phases of the clinical trials, <laughs> right? So like phase one of the clinical trial is the dose determining study. Phase two is usually efficacy, like does this work? And then phase three is where you compare it against existing paradigms. And sometimes that's placebo, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, a lot of people were wanting to participate in the MAP studies when I was there and they would ask how they could get engaged or why they didn't get selected. And it's like, there's very strict criteria to enroll in these studies. You know, there's limitations on um, all sorts of things like there's age limitations and medications and you know a lot of times if you're exploring it for a certain indication like PTSD or depression you you have to be able to show that you meet the criteria for that within very strict parameters mm -hmm. and a lot of times as well it becomes placebo controlled or um, you know so there's like a 50 50 percent chance that you could get a placebo or you could get another drug so say like I don't think I've seen this for any of the psychedelic studies yet. It might come in more with phase three as other options become available. But say, for example, if we get to the point where there's a phase three microdosing study, you may get randomized into an arm of a study where you're taking a conventional antidepressant because that's what you're up against if you're trying to prove its effectiveness, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's not a, a, a glamorous process to enroll in a clinical trial. I think people think that it's, um, you know, it takes effort. And right, there's right. a lot of work that goes into it that's not necessarily just showing up and taking MDMA and having a great time, exactly. you know? <laughs> so just, you know, important for people to know, because I've had a lot of people, you know, interest in it because of their own personal exploration or wanting mm -hmm. to help the space or whatever it ends yeah. up being. But I guess for people that are listening to this, just so you know, if you do sign up, it doesn't mean you'll necessarily be getting, you know, a high dose of MDMA and have a great time. You very yeah. well could be sober and just yeah. enrolled in a clinical trial, you know? Yeah. for the placebo but yeah. um i just think that's important for people to know because a lot of people don't actually understand are there like one or two going on underway yeah. in the united states or are there thousands yeah. um i'd love i'd love to hear a little bit more about you know we, we kind of had this conversation which i'm laughing at myself because every time someone comes to record the podcast we end we end up like start talking right away and like <laughs> there's so much good juicy information i'm like wait wait start, backtrack like, backtrack let's start recording before we talk about this but um i want to talk about you know integrity is a word that is thrown around a lot in mm -hmm. in the psychedelic industry specifically mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's a really exciting conversation to have because i think it's one of the most unique industries where you can have a conversation around integrity mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. it's it's a very interesting one to to listen to and be a part of and learn about but mm -hmm. um everyone has a very different opinion of it and mm -hmm. i would love you to just kind of share a little bit more on, on you know your perspective um whether it's integrity or who you think is doing it right in the space what are the criteria of companies that you look for whether it's you partnering with them mm -hmm. um or just like you know things that you think if you are specifically from the company side yeah. of things not the individual side of who mm -hmm. to engage with like from the company side mm -hmm. what is your version of integrity um when you're building a psychedelic for-profit company yeah yeah um so of course like everyone uses this 
this like kind of keyword buzz term, but sacred reciprocity, like people do have to honor the sacred root of this work and what they're doing. And so um, I think most people do. I think most people feel the call to work with this work because of a personal experience that they had with psychedelics. But, you know, I think the sort of cliche that you see is that like someone will have a really impactful psychedelic experience and then get that call to pursue that. And the call to them is their to make it their career. Mm -hmm. And even that alone is kind of like capitalist conditioning of like, oh, okay, well, this is really important. So I'm going to like make it my calling so that way I can make money off of it, derive power from it, derive recognition and, you know, uh, make a company, be successful. And a lot of those underlying motives are not fully conscious. And so I'm not saying this to say that it's wrong to have those motivating factors, because I think if you're interacting with the Western world, like that is deeply conditioned in all of us, even me and you, you know, like we're in front of the camera now and mm-hmm. <laughs> got this cute little background and we're going <laughs> to post on our Instagram and it's going to look super cute. Right. But <laughs> you have to think about for me, like when I'm looking at whether or not to work with a company, it's whether what I'm trying to evaluate is their awareness and integration of those motivating factors. So someone who sits there and says like, you know, I have good intentions. This isn't about ego. This isn't about money. Like that's where the red flag gets thrown up for me. Um, Because first of all, if it's even remotely related to your career or a business, money is a factor. And, you know, I think we get a little caught up in that because capitalism has made it such that money is the primary motivating factor And it's, you know, just like crushing every other objective in these really strongly profit driven companies, which is why people are afraid because they have these kinds of wounds around money where they don't want to admit that that's a motivating factor. But you can't sustain a business without money being a motivating factor. So, you know, it just always trips me up when like someone says like, I want to start like a direct to consumer ketamine shipping company or a VC firm. And, you know, it's not going to really be about the money. That doesn't matter to me. It does matter to you because it's a business and it has to matter to you. And so you're For me, I don't want to work with a company that is not keeping that in mind, you know? And so I think it's about, you know, we see this a lot when we talk about the ego and spirituality as well. It's like having, um, denying that you have your ego, like your ego is not your amigo, is like a kind of a lack of an integration of your shadow. And so it has that parallel into the psychedelic industry as well of like, okay, I I do have motivating factors by having the call to work within this space. And rather than acting like I don't, um, let me really take a look at the impact of my work over the intention of it. That's a big mantra for me is impact over intention. Mm -hmm. And to constantly put in checks and balances and question where that ego is coming into play, getting curious about it and kind of doing that inner work and integrating that within yourself to make sure that the work that you're doing is actually helping the people who need it most. So I think that's really like the key discerning factor for me is uh, when you see the people who kind of go into this with this like exuberant optimism and are overselling and overstating the benefits of psychedelics as a means to build an industry without talking about the risks, without talking about, you know, some of the limitations and the fact that these aren't magic pills and they're really just tools to kickstart a process within ourselves and our communities, that's where you kind of get tripped up. And so... You see it a lot, especially because the industry is so new. Um, I think everyone kind of goes through some of these stages as they work within the industry. And so I think another thing, too, is um, also to have a lot of compassion for when you see that in other people in the industry. Mm -hmm. So what you see is like the people kind of start to go through that and then they may integrate that. But then they'll see other people doing it and they'll start to kind of point the finger at them. And then everyone is just sitting around like pointing finger of like you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. And it's like whenever you're pointing your finger at someone that hard, especially like in your own industry and this type of work, you kind of got to like, you know, (laughs) say like, why am I judging? Why am I not having compassion for where these people are at in the space and on their journey? And so, you know, the industry is very charged um, because we feel like there's this, you know, this, the stakes are high, you know, people want other people to heal and they want this to go through and there's, there's a lot weighing on it. And so, um, yeah, it's, it can be really difficult to kind of have that level of discernment of like what works and what doesn't in the industry. But um, I think it's just, yeah, really important to have a lot of like compassion for the trial and error of it. So if someone says something that's kind of like the red flag for you, instead of just like going into finger pointing mode or dismissal or gossip, like to just like have patience with those people and work with them and, and understand that maybe you yourself were sort of in that place at one point as well. I love that. And, you know, what has been such an interesting thing, you know, and I've been really 
having, you know, hours of conversations every single week around this space for the last 24 months, like really like making it a part of my career. Mm -hmm. And um, the more that I learn, the more that I know that I do know, I know nothing. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like one Socrates? day you kind of have like an understanding. Is that Socrates or Plato? Is that like, can I just quote Socrates? I don't know. I think it is Socrates. Some, someone, ancient, someone ancient that's like way wiser than me. And, you know, one of the things that I, um, I had an event and was speaking to someone before the event and you know, was was talking about something, and they shared with me their their view on sacred reciprocity and like all these kind of different elements of like, um, you know, even like certain certain um, you know, entheogens that are going you know extinct that are that are that are scarce, and I was like, whoa, this other person who's working in this space actually is is genuinely coming into it with good intention has no idea what this information is mm -hmm. and so a lot of it's just like you know naivete across mm -hmm. different fields and why i find it to be so important to just like knowledge share from people like a lot of people are coming into it with integrity um but that are just a little green you mm -hmm. know and, yeah. they, and they just don't know and so like they're so excited to give their energy to the space but then mm -hmm. when i've seen people get shut down where they have yeah. a lot of good potential to like yeah. really contribute something really special yeah. but someone who's seasoned veteran who has a lot of knowledge like people don't have the knowledge that you have and that's why i think it's important for you to come do um you know podcasts like this and like share your message and your voice and like share as much of it as possible bring the right people together and like have these knowledge sharing so that everyone's not building in their silos and they're like oh shit, yeah. i built an entire company around something that's going extinct and i probably shouldn't build a company <laughs> around it you know what i mean and like yeah. it's so find that really important i would love just to kind of like you know double click on on sacred reciprocity for a second yeah for people that don't understand fully what that means like what does it mean to you when a when a company is correctly implementing sacred reciprocity into their work environment yeah yeah so to explain sacred reciprocity and kind of take a step back at a whole as a whole from a historical perspective, um, psychedelics have had a prevalence in almost every culture for multiple generations. So, you know, it's kind of been wiped out from the Western world historically for a number of reasons. I think the thing that's most present for us is government, right? Because we had that we had that resurgence with the counterculture in the 60s and 70s, and then the government went in and kind of wiped that out with scheduling acts and things like that. So that's where we see a lot of it wiping out. But it was happening prior to that, too. It was happening with, you know, religious oppression, um, with just imperialism and colonization in general, sort of wiping out some of these sacred traditions. So I think it's important when we're looking at safe, sacred reciprocity to see that these practices and traditions are present in almost all of our, in all of our cultures. You know, it's pretty... Um, hard, you'll be hard pressed to find a culture where if you trace back far enough, it didn't exist. So there's the understanding that in the Western world, it has largely been wiped out and that we um, build a lot of our healing frameworks around empiricism and the scientific method, which has only been around for like a few hundred years, it's very rooted in logic and reason and things like that. Um, now, meanwhile, as we've been doing this, we've been experiencing a lot of limitations in those healthcare systems that we've developed and the ways that we you know, develop and sustain our well-beings. And all the while, there have been indigenous cultures that have protected and stewarded this ancient wisdom passed down multiple generations for millennia. And think about how hard that must be in a world that is like dominated by imperialism, where Western culture takes over a lot of these different cultures to really protect that ancient practice, right? And so you know, now we're sort of in this era where, um, you know, there's something called the ipanema. It's like the sickness, this dark energy that we have that's maybe a little bit unidentifiable that's, as it's referred to in some indigenous cultures. And, you know, we're, we're going out and seeking healing in alternative ways because we're a little bit dissatisfied with where we're at. And most indigenous cultures are, are very wary to share that wisdom for good reason. The only reason that they've been able to protect it for so long is because they had to be very secretive about it. And um, they had no one had the understanding that it may get suppressed or exploited or you know extrapolated in a way that's extractive, um, like a lot of their other resources have, right? And so sacred reciprocity is the knowing and understanding that the few indigenous cultures that have been willing to share with us um, that wisdom have done so at a great cost to their communities already. So if you look at like Maria Sabina, she is well known to be one of the people who like popularized medicinal mushrooms. She's from the Mazatec um, community in Oaxaca. And her sharing mushrooms with Westerners had great negative cost to her community, but it also 
you know, resulted in a lot of healing, right? How so for just so people understand what the negative costs are? Um, the resources were exploited in their communities. Yeah. And, um, you know, people were unsafe. A lot of people coming in and just disrupting the indigenous communities as they are. Like in indigenous communities, there is an ecosystem like a shaman in an indigenous community. It, that role is appointed by other members of the community and upheld with a lot of reverence and there's a lot of reciprocity and we're we're an individualistic culture like we're a take culture right and so um it's tra it's more transactional and so if someone from the west is going out to an indigenous culture and going and experiencing the medicine like it's hard to do so in a way that's not extractive at scale mm -hmm. there are some people who will go and really deeply connect with these communities and want to work with them but if you look at like the globalization of ayahuasca for example like there are retreat centers centered around this and and that causes disruption to the communities there um and so if everyone at scale wanted to experience that kind of healing by going into these communities it would cause even more extractions. It would hurt the resources that they have there. Mm -hmm. um, it hurt the communities that they have there. And you've, and you know, the, it can hurt their reputations. You've seen like police get involved and it's like, there's there's just a lot of different potential implications there that are risky. Um, and so what was your other question though? Well, just, you know, like for, for companies that you're looking at yeah. to, you know, act, you know, accurately or like, you know, with, with integrity, pull in, you know, the element yeah. of sacred reciprocity to yeah. their actions and their decision making. Like, what does that look like, yeah. you know, for, for, a, let's say a publicly traded psychedelic company that yeah. is starting with ketamine clinics and they yeah. are, you know, w what does sacred reciprocity mean to that business yeah. model? Yeah. So, so now that we've explained sort of like, um, the importance of the indigenous wisdom, like sacred reciprocity is the idea that you can't really operate a company in this space without uh, reverence and reciprocity for the wisdom that has been shared within these communities. So, you know, a good example is like Iboga or Ibogaine. It's a West African shrug from Gabon um, that has, you know, some preliminary data is starting to show that it has powerful effects for people with opiate addiction. Um, it's a highly exploited resource. It's kind of like a black market situation. It's not protected. It's, you know, a lot of a lot of times exploited within those communities and it takes seven years to grow. It's, it's not um, an easy thing to sustain. And the way that it's used in those cultures is with a lot of reverence. You can't use it more than a few times in your life. And every time you use it, you're supposed to plant a tree. And, you know, mm -hmm. as we have all these research, uh, certain the surging of companies that are starting to develop, you know, ibogaine related compounds. It's like, okay, they're formulating maybe a synthetic ibogaine. And so, okay, does that mean that they are not obligated to have any sort of reverence or give back to the community that developed this medicine? And this goes back to like the community driven um, culture within indigenous communities where you, you don't take things with no give back. It's and so we need to adapt that into the sort of psychedelic framework as a whole when we're running our businesses to create a community around it. Because anyone who's been in the game long enough will tell you that these are just tools for building community. And a lot of the healing is centered around the community aspect of it. So if you're not integrating sacred reciprocity, you're not fully integrating the community that has protected this medicine for so long mm -hmm. and is a big part of the reason why we're able to experience it. Um, and it's also just... You know, it's important to, to build and sustain relationships with people who hold this ancient wisdom. Like there really is the understanding that they hold things that our culture fully does not know and understand and needs to respect and have reverence for. And I think, you know, I've heard people say things like, oh, you're the one that's making this legit because you're doing, you know, these clinical trials. And for me, I'm like, it's been legitimate for a very long mm -hmm. time. Uh, and like you were saying, all I know is that I know nothing. It's It's a perspective thing. You know, we're basing things and legitimizing things off of empiricism. Um, and if you look at that from like an, episte an epistemology standpoint, which is like the theory or philosophy of knowledge, like how do we know something is fact? Here we do that through reason and clinical trials and the scientific method. But that framework is not that old. And these cultures do things through um, through intergenerational wisdom, through emotion, through intuition, and that's their science. You know, it's very heart based, but that is just as valid as reason and empiricism. And so I think that's a big part of sacred reciprocity, too, is really like revering these cultures as being valid um, in their ways of knowing just as much as we are, rather than just extracting, you know, the facets of the wisdom that benefit mm -hmm. us personally and then putting it through the scientific method to scale it. Well, you know, what's funny about that, too, is like, um, you know, what we're finding in in, in medicine mm -hmm. and, you know, why, why people are... 
having these profound realizations when they're actually diving into their trauma work is mm -hmm. that like we're now actually just putting science behind like the root cause of healing from emotions like why why when you go in and you figure out oh, okay this is coming from something that happened to me when i was three yeah. in childhood and this is where the, like this trauma and is actually stored in my body and you're actually able to like deal with that emotional response like we can put scientific data and like understanding around it mm -hmm. in like our modern you know like medicine world but yeah. it's like this ancient wisdom that, yeah. that it's this sense of knowing it's a sense of like mm -hmm. they've been using these medicines to heal traumas and work through them for you know for thousands and thousands of years yeah. and our modern world is just like symptom management all of these things so it's actually like you know this kind of like collision and a lot of parallels there right yeah and you know like what, what joe dispenza is doing is putting science and like understanding of quantum physics you know for anyone yeah. that's familiar familiar with his work um and helping people heal through that so it's actually just kind of working with people that have this very like modern sciencey brain because we mm -hmm. need that yeah you know like for example yeah. why why was michael pollan's book the most impactful thing to happen yeah. to psychedelics very logical um, <laughs> very logical yeah and so you're working with like a, a you know a brain of the, the modern person that lives in america that like mm -hmm. responds to like medicine mm -hmm. as fact mm -hmm. you know and so why yeah there you know what what's exciting i'm kind of like going to pivot for a second but yeah i think there's so much different types of you know psychedelics that are coming to fruition there's people that can go sit with ayahuasca down in peru there's people that are mm -hmm. um, going to go to their doctor's office in the middle of america and be handed yeah. a pill yeah. and be in a very clinical setting yeah. there's all these different kind of like avatars that people will resonate with yeah in which they'll engage because um, both of those people will not engage with the other. There's yeah. it's a, such a long-winded way. And so, the, like you said, there's a lot of finger pointing happening in the space. But I think what's cool to see is that there's all these different models coming out yeah. with the hopes that they'll all be brought to fruition yeah. with integrity. But yeah. um, And they all have their own place. You yeah. know, like I um, I was just talking with someone recently about like, you know, sort of like, like like you were saying, like the red flags to look for. And it's when someone says that the way that they want to do it is the right way. Like, there, you know, you see a lot of like these strong opinions of like the only way to do it is the clinical way. The only way to do it is the decriminalization way. The only way to do it is the sacred indigenous way, like in those yep. communities. And like you said, I mean, uh, Laura Narthrop is a therapist. She presented at Horizons, which you were at last year at the conference. And she made a comment. Um, she wrote a book called Radical Healership, which is amazing. Um, about how to build healing practices in profit-driven worlds. And she made this comment around like, people are too busy criticizing other people in the space, pointing through the lens of their own trauma. And so, you know, for for a person who, for example, was very let down by a modern medical healthcare system for some reason, and then sought healing in indigenous community and experienced a lot of it, would rightfully be very wary of medicalizing psychedelics in a clinical mm -hmm. setting. Whereas, uh, you know, you see and hear about um, a lot of unfortunate situations where people go into unregulated environments and experience, you know, hardship. There's, you know, dosing issues. Mm -hmm. There's sexual assault and people with people in positions of power in those communities, which is really difficult. And so those people would really want some sort of accredited, regulated way within which they can work with psychedelics and experiencing healings. And there's room for all of it. I think the issue comes up is when you say that there's only one right way. And a lot of people feel that working within um working within systems like government and working within systems like pharma um, and even like commercial products is in a way like a disservice because you're operating within these systems that perpetuate oppression. But similar to the sort of ego discussion that we had earlier, it's like to think that you could operate devoid of them, I think to me is a little bit naive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I feel like that's like the harshest thing I'm going to say today. <laughs> but, um, but there's a lot of different ways to do it, you know. Um, so yeah, there's so many different directions that you could go in. I think that we get we get really hung up in the finger pointing. Yeah. And I've definitely been like on the finger pointing side of that. Oh, yeah. Not, not <laughs> related to psychedelics, but I think, you know, in my, um, anyone that works in wellness usually had mm -hmm. a terrible experience with the Western medical system and like is like yeah. really averse to anyone engaging with it because like, oh my God, you know, all functional medicine, symptom management, which I actually really holistically believe in. But mm -hmm. I think I was so like knee jerk reaction to anything Western medicine because I had a terrible yeah. experience. I was prescribed yeah. so many pills for things that I didn't need. I went yeah. through the ringer with 
really bad doctors. And my perspective was that all doctors are bad and they are not. I know incredible doctors yeah. that are like really critical yeah. to healing. Like, you know, when you yeah. break your leg in a car accident, like you don't go sit with ayahuasca in mm-hmm. Peru. Like you go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah, you, they, exactly. There's, um, you know, and there's a time there's a time and place for, for every yeah. single thing. And yeah. I also think something important that you said, I just want to double click on for a second is, you know, these like massive conglomerate organizations that may have gotten lost in their path a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the biggest or, you know, the, the biggest organizations in the world tend to own like, you know, all of the companies underneath of them and they tend mm-hmm. to be all the consumer packaged goods space. I'm just going to talk about mm-hmm. that one as an example, but like how you revolutionize that space isn't just like starting all of these amazing wellness companies. They have to then be acquired by these companies with the resources and the power to then bring those companies to the masses. So it's not just like a dominate, let me just like crush these massive conglomerates. It's actually like become synergistic with them and slowly but surely, um, you know, I guess integrated. In- yeah. Integrated. Yeah. So there is a way, There's that is one way. There's also the way of just saying like, screw you guys, I'm going to have my own business, you know what I mean? And exactly. be independently owned and I'm going to scale it myself. And Both. I think that that's all good too, right? But um, you raise a good point there that, you know, like is really present for me right now as I'm navigating the spaces of like, okay, so say you have a wellness company or a psychedelic company and, you know, you you maybe can raise it up yourself. You can have it acquired. You're trying to Im- like integrate it. But really ultimately when we're looking at impact here, it's like how do we get these healing frameworks and these products and these resources into the communities that need them the most. So that's kind of the thing that's really that I'm kind of toying with is like, you know, especially when it comes to psychedelics, because a lot of marginalized communities have been differentially criminalized and stigmatized and oppressed because of the drug war. And so it's like, there's a massive level of re-education that needs to happen there. There's policy change that needs to happen. I mean, there's a total shift that needs to happen there. And I think it's, again, like, you know, you see these people who have this like exuberant optimism in this space and they're like, we're just gonna put ketamine MDMA in the water supply and then that's gonna <laughs> heal one person and then they're gonna heal the next person, the next person, and then the whole world is gonna be great. And on, that is on some level true, you know, it starts within one person, but psychedelics, having healthy food brands, these things are not going to, you know, overturn some of these issues like mental Mm -hmm. illness and obesity. Like when there are other aspects in our society at play that perpetuate like systems of poverty and injustice in certain communities to where they don't have access. Um, So coming up with frameworks for access is a really big thing for now. So I think for such a long time, um, the psychedelic space was so focused on showing that it wasn't just about like a party drug that fried your brain. Mm -hmm. But we're shifting now. I think people are starting to wake up to the fact that there's healing properties to this. So rather than just overstating the benefits in order for things to get ahead, can we work to build frameworks that are actually accessible for people? Right. No, I I totally agree. Because, you know, even I've seen a shift in my own. I'm from Missouri. I don't know, you know, if you know much about Missouri, but it's not (laughs) psychedelics. It's not the center of the psychedelic movement, that's Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And um it's been interesting even just to talk to people from home a few years ago versus now where like most of the conversation was focused on like – and I found myself over – how many times do you find, we find ourselves like overstating the benefits of something because we're trying yeah. to convince someone otherwise? Yeah. Um, because it's – you know, it's – it's we're so far off. Yeah. But now people are understanding that like there are, like you said, healing benefits to these – you get you if you if you read the news, you have probably seen a psychedelic article pop up because yeah. it's a very sexy headline, you know. Yeah. Um, so people are understanding that there's validity to this, but then there's the there's the downside of the magic bullet effect. People yeah. thinking that it's this is like a one hit wonder. You go and it's going to cure all of your problems. Yeah. Um, so there's like this balancing act, and so I really have a lot of respect for people that are emphasizing and often leading with like here are the downsides of psychedelics here you should not yeah. take them um yeah. and those often are the people that i'm looking up to the most in the space that are just have a very balanced approach um to the way that they're presenting the information yeah absolutely i mean and that's the thing like i you know there's now starting we're starting to have that turn of like okay let's not overstate the benefits here let's get a little bit critical you have to understand like 20 years ago no one wanted to like work with anybody like it was really hard to even get clinicians on board to research with you so like mm-hmm. you really had to like do a lot of convincing and build a lot of relationships and now that we're in this place where people are really interested and engaged in the space i kind of want to work with the clinicians that maybe don't have that kind of exposure because as things scale 
I don't necessarily maybe want to work with someone who has, you know, this deep personal story with it. I want to focus on working with the clinicians who are just coming into the space and wanting to engage with it and understand because those are people that are going to be doing it anyways. And we're going to be having a lot of people working in the space that maybe don't have a close personal tie to psychedelics. And how do we administer these psychedelics in a way that's safe and you know properly administered with a lot of understanding at scale? You know, a lot of people in psychedelics are really afraid of the word scale because they feel that it loses integrity as they do it, but it's already happening. And so what can we do and what kind of frameworks can we build um, in order to ensure that it's done safely and effectively? And I think that means in you know engaging academic leaders who maybe haven't researched with psychedelics who would be reticent like i want the people who are questioning us like um i think nida did a presentation with the nih with a bunch of psychedelic presenters and you know there were the people who were really excited and then there were the people who had a lot of reticence and a lot of you know um you know a lot of people who were kind of saying like okay well what about adolescence and you know a lot of that mm -hmm. sort of like typical um stigma but i think that's an important thing to to integrate and apply because i think if you are just overstating the benefits in order to get ahead, you're gonna actually fall into a lot of the same traps as like big pharma. Like that's what big pharma does and, and, and food industry. And I mean, a lot of these things, they overstate the benefits of things to maximize the dollar. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I think a lot of people are well-intentioned, but let's look at impact here, right? They're they're really emphasizing the benefits here to get this work out there and to get people on board to kind of overturn this stigma in our society. But once that stigma is overturned and there's a whole commercial industry built around it, people are going to be overstating the benefits in order to make a buck, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people talk about um, the cannabis industry and like what to watch out for with the cannabis industry. But you know, cannabis didn't go the FDA pharmaceutical route. And so if we're looking at like the potential downfalls of big pharma, we can look at the big one, which is Purdue Pharma. So if you look at Purdue Pharma, which created OxyContin, OxyContin um, which was owned by the Sackler family, you know, there is medical therapeutic benefit to opiates and painkillers, believe it or not, <laughs> when it's safely administered in limited amounts and not overprescribed. And so who's to say that when psychedelics get approved, they're not going to be overprescribed by people who are looking to maximize on profit. Mm -hmm. And by overstating the benefits and not introducing the risks, the limitations, the understanding that these things are powerful tools for us to facilitate healing processes within ourselves, which is a lifelong process and journey, and that it's not within that magic pill, um, that's a really hard thing to overturn within people. People are still going at psychedelics. I mean, how many people, I think everyone knows someone, especially in Venice, who's like done like 100 ayahuasca ceremonies or something. And you're like, that person's <laughs> gone. We're still running around in circles. <laughs> I know you know someone, um, right? And yeah. so, um, and so, but that's because even though you're going in this with the best intentions and you're trying to get your healing, it's you're, there's still that conditioning of us of like, I take a pill and it makes me better. And that's something outside of me is what creates my healing. And so as we're looking at this industry, as it transitions, like, I mean, think about how many people are going to get involved and the people who are going into it for their first time. I mean, you're going to see people falling into that, too. And so that's why I think that kind of like Sackler family, Purdue Pharma is like sort of the thing to be wary of mm -hmm. when things get overprescribed, when benefits get overstated. Like, I don't know if you watched that TV show with them, Dope Sick, but like they talked about how like their strategy and their marketing was like heal pain. We're going to be the ones to heal pain. Like, imagine if we can just remove pain from society. Doesn't that sound a little bit similar in thread to this idea of like, oh, we just heal all trauma in the world, just heal all the trauma and then we'll all be happy. And it's like, that's not how it works. There's a lot of limitations to these things. You have to do the work inside. We need to, we need to break down a lot of these systems of injustice in the world. You know, introducing psychedelics is not going to save everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it can make a big difference, but we still have a lot of work to do there. So mm -hmm. I think that's where we can, um, you know, take a lot of heed from. And I think even like a more accessible example is like the tobacco industry. Like tobacco is like a very sacred medicine that has been stewarded by indigenous communities. But, you know, with these sacred medicines, it's like a less is more approach, right? Um, and in capitalist consumerism, it's a more is more approach. And so mm -hmm. um, it's taken from a very sacred practice that's used in a very small amount, then it's processed, um, capitalized on to maximize sales that's when you're looking at it actually creating more harm than it does good. And do we want to be in that situation with psychedelics? No. <laughs> a little bit of a stretch example, but like, you know, part of the problem with alcohol and the way that it's it's brought into 
at least the way that it was brought into my world, it was like, yeah. it was like, don't take any of it. And then when you go to college, drink as much of it as you can, yeah. you know? And like, yeah. whereas in, you know, Europe, they are, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, Flora Bellini yeah. talks a lot about progressive dosing. And I love the way that she explains this. And yeah. it's like, you know, my most impactful experiences with, with the psychedelics or with anything like has not been when I'm taking the max, you know, and yeah, degree. Off. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I talk a lot about microdosing. That's a huge part of what I'm passionate about. And there's there's such an interesting conversation around like this less is more. And, you know, I actually think what you what you're sharing around you have like the hype people, right? Like the hype men around these industries. And then you have, you know, like the critics or the or the or the skeptics, if mm -hmm. you will. Maybe not the critics, the skeptics, people that are more skeptical. Yeah. I actually think that's like a really beautiful business model yeah. pairing <laughs> to bring those people together. Like those yeah. two people should be co-founders. Yeah. And um the companies that I'm I'm really inspired by, their actual board is diversified in that mm -hmm. sense. Like who is you know, just as you want, like all these, if you have all these different avatars living in your own brain of like, yeah. this is your happy version of yourself. This is the more critical person. This yeah. is like kind of a bitchy version. This is yeah, like, yeah. um, the one, you know, the one that's like super goofy. Like you should have all of those representations inside an actual company. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's why I believe in these dinners and things yeah. like that, where you get this diversity of perspective mm -hmm. just to come together, sit around the same table yeah. and, and talk around what is needed. And then hopefully those people will go collaborate together. Yeah. Um, cause all people are actually no, that was an incorrect statement. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, a lot of the people are are well intentioned, but just naive to various aspects. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just, I just really on believe journey. in that on, on their, their journey, journey. As, yeah. as we all are. Um, and that's that's where like the sacred like reciprocity comes into play because by integrating those voices and making room for them, um, while you know reciprocating into their community is of course an exchange for um, that wisdom on some level. You're you're getting that sort of insight and perspective and that that check and balance on mm -hmm. what you're doing, like. You know, um, there was a shaman I worked with once who was giving very small doses of medicine. And even I, with all this work I've done, was frustrated. I was like, oh, come on. Like, let me feel something. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's that's just it's just the framework. It's like you pay. How much money do you pay to go to a ceremony? And then you're like, I want to feel something. Right. But but th these things aren't linear. It's not like I you pay more money, you get more healing. It's, it's not how it works. And right. the way, you know, kind of like what you were saying, Floor was referring to is like, you know, you introducing these things incrementally in small doses allows you to build a relationship with mm -hmm. the medicine within your own energy, right? So, you know, a lot of people really like that, like 5-MeO-DMT blast off feeling, right? Which is, <laughs> it's like jolly a great time, but <laughs> maybe. Um, and so, but a lot of times when people try to have that like blast off where they do these super large doses of psychedelics, it can introduce a panic, right? I mean, you know, obviously. And so we sit because we don't understand how these things are working with our energy. Whereas if you start with less, yeah, yeah. you can kind of build up into understanding and integrating it within your own energy, which allows you to work with the medicine over time. And maybe eventually you can get to that point. Well, and, and too, like, you know, there's a lot of people, I think why, even from my own perspective, a lot of my initial inversion to drugs, because um, I grew up with the D.A.R.E. program, the whole thing, like just, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was very, very, um, just say no to drugs, very scary, like not a lot of conversation around anything like this. Mm -hmm. But it was actually from experiencing people that I knew in my world that did a lot of drugs and they just seemed so far off. Like they mm -hmm. were, I feel like they were just floating around in the in the shamanic realm all the time where they yeah. weren't grounded in reality. And like mm -hmm. the why integration, all these things are so important is if you go have this macro dose or hero dose experience across yeah. any psychedelic and then you try to, you know, like come back to work the next day and you're, you know, yeah. you're with your partner and you're like, oh my God. And you know, I, I saw Jesus and I had all these things and they're like, do you want to go to the grocery store? Like we're, you're on totally yeah. different planes. Yeah. Um, whereas, What's, you know, microdose is, is a little bit easier to integrate that back into yeah. like this real world that we live in. Yeah. And there's like a book, I think it's called like After Enlightenment, then comes the laundry or something like that. Yeah, like, exactly. Do, if you want to, I mean, some people like, I mean, if you want to, yeah, <laughs> if you want to like leave America yeah. and then go meditate on a hill, go off the grid, all those things, that's fine. But if chances are, if you want to interact with the world, it's like you didn't come to be this egoless, identityless ball of divine energy on this earth in this incarnation. At least you came to be Ali, who has insecurities and fears and mm -hmm. a lot of love to give and is on her path and but would still be afraid if a car came up to her because she has an ego and she's afraid of getting hit by that car. Right. And yeah. so it's like. We, we came to interact with these aspects of our ego. And so I think for people who kind of get stuck in the medicine, you see it a lot, but I have compassion for that too. I think it's almost like, um, it's almost like getting addicted to video games. It's like the addiction to the, not fantasy, but just like 
being outside of the the suffering that mm -hmm. we experience in this world. And so I think that's where it is really important for education to come in. So that way we can minimize that because I think, you know, you don't, you see so many people who, or we know so many people who have positive interactions with psychedelics and, you know, um, the average drug user in this country is like an upper middle class white man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not the stigma that we have in this country around what a drug user looks like, right? And so I think if we can shift that and create more education, like you were saying, it's kind of like you had this dare type education. It's almost similar to like sex ed where we had this like abstinence, don't do it type of education, right. but we all have the inclination in us to explore our consciousness. And so if we come across it, it's about creating these frameworks through education of how to do so safely in a way that's integrated. Have you, know. you read the book, uh, Drug Use for Grownups? You know what's funny is <laughs> Carl Hart's on the board of MAPS, and it was when I was there as well. Um, I've seen him speak before multiple times. I actually have not had time to sit down and read the book, but I'm a huge fan of his. Okay, yeah. I, and I figured you would be by the way that you're you're speaking. I know Lauren Lauren Taus, who's been on the podcast as well. Um, the book Love has been her. like floating around in my field. Mm -hmm. I, I have finally read it, and it is a game changer because it's like mm -hmm. all these concepts that I know to be true. I really believe in cognitive liberty and. Mm -hmm. um, the way that he describes everything, like this is just, I plugged this on the last podcast. So like mm -hmm. if anyone's listen, listen to that one, listen, to, like go read, go read the book. It's, yeah, it's incredible. It's really, really, it's really, really good. And it talks a lot about, you know, it's, it's, it's self-titled. I won't, I won't, I won't dive into it here because it's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but it's mm -hmm. about drug use for grown up adults. Yeah. And um, it just yeah. paints a totally different picture of, yeah. of how to incorporate them responsibly into your world. Yeah. A few last questions for you sure. before we wrap up. We Let's also do should it. do another one of these because there's so much more that I didn't get a, <laughs> Awesome. Didn't get to talk to you about, yeah, but um, what is like the if you had, if you had to summarize the impact that you hope that your work in this space makes on the world? What would you say? Like what your, your you know your specific you you have a very unique um, path that you've gone down. You're kind of like exploring some different opportunities now where you're advising companies. Like, what's your goal? How do you hope that this kind of like all comes to fruition? If it's like best case scenario, it all comes to fruition exactly how you hope. Yeah. I feel like there's so much I in that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I like, I feel very like kind of um, almost like camera shy. And, like, you can answer it as in we as we yeah. in the collective. <laughs> well, I feel like it's, it's just such a big behemoth of an industry, you know? And I feel like for me as one person to think that I can like make that I'm just like I am just praying that I can like nudge the needle like like one centimeter in mm. the direction enough to create safer frameworks for people to be able to facilitate their own healing um you know and shifting that paradigm around how we look at our own healing and even if that's just like one person <laughs> I would be so happy honestly I mean I think that's where we get caught up like in our careers and just in the way things are structured here is around scale um but you know, if it if it really just helps like one person and shifts for one person, then that's all I can ask for. What is this is always what we close with. Um, but what is the most important lesson that psychedelics or mushrooms have, have taught you? The most important lesson that psychedelics or mushrooms have taught me. The reason oh, why I throw that in is if you know it could be functional mushrooms, it could be chaga yeah. that's taught you the most about your life. Like it could, could I don't talk to Chaga much, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> it talk back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's talking to me. Um, I think just that everyone's doing their best, including me. Yeah, I think like I think it. The biggest lesson for people individually is going to be based on sort of what they were like going into it and going into it. I was a person who had very high expectations of myself, very high expectations of others and the world around me, and um, you know, just kind of bringing that into that compassion of understanding that everyone is doing their best, including me. And so to go um, to go at it gently with myself and others is the biggest thing. I love that. What is on the next six month agenda for you? What are you excited about? Anything you mm -hmm. wanna share? You know, I know a lot of your projects mm -hmm. are, um, you know, I, I know some of them are public, some of them you're, 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 you're working on, um, but anything you wanna share? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely deepening my advocacy work right now. And, you know, one of my many mantras in this work is to just always honor the sacred root of the work within myself as I'm doing it. And I think a lot of people get lost in that. And I admittedly have too. I've, you know, gotten into periods where I was working like 14 hour days, multiple days a week, pulling all nighters and, and not really caring for myself. And so how much can a completely burnt out person who has not taken care of themselves, um, you know, 
shape this industry when they're not in alignment and integrity within themselves. And I think so many people, I think there's like a bit of a wounded healer complex that like Carl Jung uh, coined that term of just like people a lot of times want to heal others because their own wound, because of they have their own wounds inside and they want to be able to heal others through that to like redeem it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, and so you see a lot of people who put so much pressure on themselves to push this through. And that's why there's so much tension and divide in the field because people aren't operating from that place of, you know, what they came to the medicine for. So to be honest, <laughs> um, I think the next six months for me are gonna be about realigning with that, the work personally, and just sort of, as I'm advising companies before I jump into anything full-time, just, yeah, realigning with that integrity and ensuring that that's coming out every day within myself and then how that goes into the work from there. Amazing, and where can people find you? Let's see, I, uh, Instagram is probably the best place, Dorna P, D-O-R-N-A-P. And then my name, dornaparang.com, is where they can reach me for professional stuff. Okay, amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll have to do another one of these because I learned a lot. I'm excited um, for people to hear this, especially, awesome. you know, around the, the clinical trial stuff. I think that's I think that's really, really interesting, and you just mm -hmm. have such a great perspective. So thank you course, for taking the time pleasure. to thank come Thank you on. for having me. You're the best. And <laughs> more to come. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for diving into the multiverse with us. If you're interested in being a future guest on the show, sponsorship, partnership, or you're just mushroom curious, we're always looking to expand our mycelium network. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Into the Multiverse, where you can find clips from this podcast, psychedelic legalization news, events that we're doing, and so much more. In addition, we've also created the world's first ever mushroom-specific marketplace called The Multiverse, which you can find on Instagram at Multiverse or online at yourmultiverse.com. We've also created our own in-house consumer lifestyle brand called Super Mush. We make mushroom mouth sprays. We make a whole line of mushroom streetwear. You can find it on Instagram at Super Mush or online at supermush.com. We'll see you next week. Mush love.